Okay, so we're back. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Sorry, we lost you uh, before, but we're saying, how are you dealing with uh, this newfound fame? Oh, no. We've got a big problem with the technical, it seems. So I think we're back. Hopefully, uh, it, it, okay. it's connected. Okay. Again, Charmaine, how are you dealing with all the the, the fame and recognition you're getting? Yes. Uh, so basically, I had some experience on the media before because I had been director of health promotion and disease prevention director for nine years. So part of that work includes um, health promotion activities. So it's a lot of communications um, about health matters. I had that experience um, and since like the four years I've been a superintendent of public health and um, this has continued but it was never like this time because with um, the daily media briefs that I give on COVID um, I've seen that I really entered the households um, of the Modis population and even those who are not Modis so um, uh, the feedback that we're getting is really um, very um, awesome. Um, and uh, obviously you're an inspiration to many women as well, um, uh, especially because of the way you, you, you manage to conduct yourself so, so calmly and politely even when, when you're receiving the same question over and over again as well. Uh, are you like that at home as well? Are you a very patient person in general? Yes, 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 because I guess um, it's in my character. Um, but also because um, I, when you're working as superintendent of public health, there's a lot of uh, very serious issues that you have to deal with. Um, so the tolerance level is very much different. So I don't mind at all the same questions because um, I believe those are the questions which are coming from the general public. And if we have to repeat those a million times, we will repeat those a million times. As long as we satisfy the queries that the population will have, I'm fine with that. As you said, you're doing a press conference every single day. I don't think I don't even think politicians do do that. Uh, what, what if something happens to you? As in, do you have a second in command? Is there, is there someone who you know? If, what if you get sick, for example? Is there someone who can take your place? Yes, yes. In fact, um, even by law, um, we have the authority also to delegate to somebody else. Um, I'm surrounded by many um, public health doctors who are specialists in the area. And um, perhaps the general public see me as a face, but this space reflects a lot of other people who are working. And um, we meet very frequently, um, both here in the office, but also we get to meet using various mediums now, um, which is brilliant because you can get everyone on board. And we are moving um, through a lot of work which is being done in the background, um, which is evidence-based. That's how we are trained to work, looking at what really works, learning a lot from other countries, 
from the way that they have made good progress, some mistakes that everyone does. So it's a learning process for everyone as well. But it's a whole team um, which works together very well. So I want to start asking you some questions about COVID. Um, first of all, from a, like a very kind of macro level, um, We've seen this weekend a decision to start to relax the measures. Uh, is that mostly influenced by the fact that you know the economy is struggling and obviously you know people are getting tired, staying at home, etc.? Or is that a way of kind of speeding things up a little bit since things have slowed down uh, to to such a degree in terms of the movement of the virus? Like, is there something to be said about um, moving, uh, allowing the virus to 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 Con continue spreading to some extent, or are we just trying to exterminate completely? No, remember that um, this is a virus um, which is the same virus that we had in the beginning, so it hasn't changed. Um, the way that it spreads from one person to the other is still the same, and um, we still don't have a vaccine, so we have no way of controlling it except using public health measures. So our strategy as planned from the beginning was that we contain the situation as much as we can. We know that this is a virus which um, can lead people to going to hospital, especially the vulnerable people who will need admissions, and also a virus which can kill people. So what we really wanted was to contain the situation as much as we can and cocoon the vulnerable people as much as we can so that we will protect the ones who really um, will need hospitalization and eventually can get complications. So now um, we've done with... Go ahead, sorry. Yeah. Now we've come to a phase whereby the um, spread of the virus within the population, which is measured through what is called RT, so that's the rate of transmission um, of the virus within the community, has gone below one. So if you're having less than one person being infected from each other, that is a means of control because eventually you start reducing. So that was the time when we had our R1, which is less than one for two weeks, that was a time for relaxation of the measures. So that was the reason why we actually um, put in these relaxation of these measures exactly at this point in time, because it was time to do it. We have to remember that um, it's a balance that we need to make sure that we are protecting health fully. So if you just had to live in a world where there's only health, you would have remained where we are now because we're doing well. But obviously, there's the economy, which needs to continue moving. Um, there are people who need to continue working. And all this is important that we need to maintain it because health is dependent a lot also on other factors, including employment, the income of people, um, and also um, the health of the population is also dependent on wealth. So this is a balance we need to make sure. Well, whilst we continue protecting the public from this virus, through the various measures, we need to make sure as well that we keep rolling as well with whatever we can roll out in terms of economy. So when it comes to the vulnerable people and the elderly, for example, um, until there is a vaccine, can they expect to continue living this, this current life, uh, maybe with, with slight, uh, you know, improvements and relaxations, you know, but until there is a vaccine? No, we know that the path to the development of the vaccine is a couple of months. So um, that is one reality we need to face. But that's not just it. We need to um, see that once this vaccine is developed, then it's rolled out to all the populations. And having a vaccine for the whole world is not an easy feat. So in our plans, we um, are cognizant that we need to continue to protect the vulnerable However, we cannot wait till the very end until the vaccine is available because that will be um, quite a long time. So in our plans, um, we are working um, to see how eventually when the time is right, we can see how we can ease on some uh, measures on the vulnerable, but still making sure that they are being protected in the same way. We want to give our vulnerable people, especially the elderly and other people who have chronic conditions, the best they can get out of life at this point in time, protecting them, but also seeing how we can ease up some of the measures, but always when the time is really right to do it. So for example, perhaps we might be able to visit our relatives at some point, but not necessarily then be able to go to concerts, right? 
Exactly, exactly. You need to make sure that um, the vulnerable people will not be going out into groups, etc. But um, with time, we are working on what measures we can introduce. It's not yet the time, so we need to be a bit more patient. I appeal to the we, we, public to be a bit more patient. We know that there's now um, the active cases have fallen to the 70s, yes. right? And the number of people in hospitals are, are, are actually very, very low. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, we've been extremely successful at, at managing the situation in a way that other countries have failed uh, really radically. But is it fair to say that healthcare workers are now you know, much less busy than they were expecting to be by, by this time and even less busy because of other... Uh, so many other things must be reducing as well, right? If we're, if we're staying home so much, then probably even things like the flu in general and, and, and things like that are, are reducing, right? What, what is it like? Give us a sense of the, the hospitals and, and yeah. the, the, the real life of healthcare workers today. Yeah, um, our major issue in the beginning of this was that we were still at just high levels of the influenza season. But now we have been quite lucky that with all the measures that we have done, we have managed to survive through the peak of influenza. So the double burden of having two viruses at the same time, we're like past that. Um, we're still preparing for it because we know that come October, we will start having flu cases as well. So we need to be really prepared there to take up these double uh, burdens of the um, viruses. And um, there's no immunity if you get COVID, doesn't mean you won't get flu. There are two different viruses, so you can get both. Um, what's happening right now is that um, during the phase of the containment of the pandemic, we have actually had to reduce a number of the services that we were providing. We had to reduce these because um, we wanted to reduce the influx of the people who um, weren't um, requiring emergency services or really um, demanding services, like, for example, some elective um, surgeries which could wait a couple of months um, but also we had all our health care workers who were being trained into dealing with COVID because our expectation was that we needed to be prepared in case we had a high influx of patients in our hospital. We knew that we were doing our utmost in containment but we wanted to be sure that we will be prepared whatever outcome will come so now we're in a phase whereby the number of cases in hospital, as you rightly said, is very low. In fact, in modern day, we only have one case in ITU and another case in the infectious diseases unit right now. We have a number of other cases in St. Thomas and a number of other cases in Norfolk. So that means um, the burden of the actual patients on COVID in modern day now is less. However, now we need to catch up with um, whatever we could in this interim phase. And that is why part of the measures that we introduced was to start kicking up on the services that we need to um, provide to the public. Some well, of them are from... There's a backlog, right? I mean, there were there were certain even you know tests and things that were not happening that could could save lives as well. Those sort of tests yes. and, and operations, right? Exactly. That, that's very important. So we were doing the um, services and the support to the public, um, which were of urgent nature or as um, semi-urgent nature. But um, some things which could wait a couple of months, they had to wait. So now is the time to catch up. However, we are focusing also on making sure that we are protecting the people with chronic diseases. We cannot have um, the people who are suffering from chronic diseases from um, having deterioration in this condition because those people will be the ones who will be affected most if we had an increase in the number of COVID cases. So that's one of the major focus that we have. For example, another situation that we saw within primary care was that um, unfortunately we had a drop in the number of vaccination uptakes that we had. I understand that parents um, were concerned around this time and many of them didn't bring their children for their due vaccinations because they said, yes, I can wait like a couple of months perhaps until um, this is all over. So now we need to find the opportunity now to uh, make sure that we upgrade our vaccination coverage rates because we really cannot afford another outbreak of another vaccine preventable disease like, for example, measles. Malta has managed these vaccine preventable diseases like measles very well. You see what happens in other countries with measles. So we cannot afford that right now. 
we, we speak about, uh, or you've spoken often about enhanced testing, um, and there are some countries, I believe, that have tried to test, you know, almost their, their entire population. Malta, I believe the number is up to 37,000 or, or, or thereabouts. Um, is there a possibility to just, uh, this is a question we received a lot, is there a possibility to test everyone in the country and then just keep the ones who, who are um, who are positive sort of indoors until we can just get back to normal life? Yes, uh, this is a question because um, the actual swab test is not an actual screening test. What it does is actually um, it identifies whether you have particles of the virus in your throat, nasopharynx, um, if you are actually carrying the virus at that particular point in time. So what it actually tells you is whether you are actually carrying the virus at that point in time. It could be tomorrow that you will be carrying the virus because you meet someone else or else you would have accumulated enough virus for the test to pick it up. So it's not like a test whereby you check everyone who's in is in, who's out is out. Um, it actually determines the people who are carrying the virus at that particular point in time. We wish we could have had that type of, uh, of test to be done, um, but it is not available. So this is what we're working with. And what we're doing is enhancing the testing, as we rightly outlined, um, identifying groups of people, especially we are picking up people like from um, the AFM, from the police, um, from various healthcare workers, from various sectors um, who are willing to come um, to be tested, even though they are asymptomatic. And as you can see from our figures, um, if you actually remove the population of um, the half our um, residents, um, we actually found that there are 11% of the actual positives who are asymptomatic. So this is a reality that we are seeing, both locally and also abroad, where you actually see people who don't have any symptoms at all and actually are carrying the virus. So these are the people we need to know about because we need to know exactly what's going out out there in the community, but also in order to be able to ask those people to isolate themselves and prevent the spread to other people. And so these enhanced tests are, are in populations that you think might be more likely to go out than others. Exactly. Exactly. And, and when, we say, when we say today, for example, I think you said that there were 700 tests carried out yesterday. Yeah. Some days there is a thousand, a thousand two hundred. Um, what what determines that fluctuation? Is it the number of people who you've asked to show up, whether they show up or not, or is it um, just sometimes you manage to to book this number and sometimes you manage to book another number of tests? It depends on a, on a lot of factors. Um, one of them is the number of people who are calling us on our helpline one one one. So that is dependent on the people who are actually having symptoms and um, on evaluation of their symptoms, then we book them an appointment to come and be tested. It also depends on the people's compliance in coming or else some of them, uh, for example, we always see that in the weekend we get fewer people coming. Somehow people are not very willing to come for testing in the weekend. And also, it's also dependent now um, on the enhanced um, testing program that we get groups of people, especially from workplaces, um, to actually come and be tested. Um, over the past week, we have managed to ramp up our numbers over 1,000. But yesterday, it went down um, to 700, which is something which is quite common for a Sunday number. And, and we got this question, I don't know if, if it's a silly one, but is there a less invasive way of doing tests? I mean, you've got some people with very um, sensitive noses, for yes. example. You know, is, 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 is there another way of doing it? Yes, I understand it may not be so comfortable. And the anatomy of everyone, nasopharynx, is completely different. So um, our swabbing team are excellent in doing this. They get regular training. Um, so that we make sure that the, the patient is as comfortable as possible and the uncomfort of having a nasal swab is as, as pleased as it could be. Um, however, this is the gold standard test that we have. Um, we are currently um, also having um, validation of tests which are done through blood. Um, the point of care testing where you take just a bit of capillary blood from the finger, like what we do for, for example, when we test for um, blood glucose, we have found that those are not really so reliable, so we're not using them. So we hope that with the serology, we will be able to have validated tests 
and also that will give us an indication of the immune response of the population. But that is what it gives you. It, do, it gives you um, what is the immune response to um, the virus, which is not always um, very high. So you could be have had the virus and still did not build an immune response. Okay, so I want, I want to clarify that point because there's some reports in the media, especially in the UK over this past week, which found that, which is saying that, you know, people who have had uh, COVID um, can't get it again. Or there, there were some, uh, several months ago, there were issues that people in Wuhan started to get it again, but then they said that the testing wasn't quite right in those cases. So what is the situation really? If, if you have COVID, can we say today with any certainty that you can't get it again, that you'll be immune from it or not at all? No, we cannot really say. Um, we haven't um, seen such an immune response which is sustained in the people who have been um, uh, found to be positive. So when um, a person is immune is when the levels of antibodies um, increase to a high level and they are the type of antibodies called IgG which gives the immune response um, on a long term. So we're not seeing that in everyone. In fact, the World Health Organization issued a warning and an alert saying, don't use immunity passports. Um, immunity passports is when you have someone who is tested um, who is tested positive for antibodies and like you give him an immune passport whereby they can go out and, and be immune to this virus. WHO said, don't use that because we don't know whether people can get reinfected again. This has implications on the vaccine production. So um, this is one of the worries that um, is out there in actual the research which is going on. But we don't have any cases where uh, people in Malta have been infected and then they get cured and then they're reinfected. Up to now, we didn't have that. So um, we haven't had the same people who are coming back with symptoms uh, retested and found positive after um, a couple of days would have passed from the recovery. Okay, um, we're speaking a lot about mosques today um, and, and over this weekend. Um, so we have quite a lot of questions on those. I'll just ask some quick fire ones. First of all, uh, d does one need to wear a mask even when they're outdoors? No, we haven't um, uh, guided the public to wear masks or visors when they are out in the streets. Um, we have um, done our measures um, only when you have people who are going to enter an enclosed area, mainly, um, where there are a number of other people who you usually don't meet up with. So there would be people outside your household, people outside your workplace. So the recommendation is when you're entering retail outlets, it's important that you wear a mask. When you are going on a bus, wear a mask or a visor. Um, this is important um, because some people think that you wear a mask to protect yourself. It's the other way around. If you have the virus, you're putting on a mask so that it will prevent um, the transmission of the viral particles from you to other people. That's how this works. So it is me protecting you. So that is why it is very important that everyone wears a mask when they are in contact with other people who are different from your usual contacts. Okay. And um, we, we, we had these sort of relaxation of measures. So, but at the same time, <clears throat> previously, we didn't have sort of, it wasn't obligatory to wear masks in supermarkets and things like that, right? So was this kind of the compromise to relax the, the measures a little bit? But in, in, in actual fact, when it came to masks, the measures became more aggressive, right? Is that uh, a compromise? Yeah. Yeah, you have to understand that um, the way we did our um, transition strategy, whereby we started um, relaxing the measures that we had instituted, um, we did a risk assessment of these measures, whereby we identified a number of criteria, like, for example, the time that a person stays within a particular place, um, whether there is aerosolization, um, whether it's indoor, whether it's outdoor, um, the risk of contact from one person to the other, the vulnerability. We have weighted all these criteria, given them the weight of the importance that they deserved, and we actually then scored and based on a risk assessment of all the measures. And um, we had high scores for all the measures, because if you see the way that they actually acted, they acted in terms of reducing the numbers. So, in order to have them reinstituted back, 
you need to have mitigation measures. And these mitigation measures are based on basic principles of prevention and social distancing, whereby the prevention is like the frequent hand washing, the alcohol rubs, the use of a mask, because you will prevent transmission from other people, and the social distancing, whereby people uh, cannot be in close um, uh, distance with each other, and also that there wouldn't be a large number of people in the same place. And hence the measures of mitigation that we have actually controlled the number of people who are coming in a specific retail outlet and the number of people who are going on those of channel. These are all based on evidence. And this is the way we have been working and whereby we do a proper risk assessment um, actually developed by the same team so that we will be sure on and sure grounds um, whatever we're doing, we're taking the utmost of the measures that we can do to control the possible increase that we will have. So other questions on masks. You said today that children under the uh, of, uh, under three years of age don't need to wear masks, correct? Um, and can can masks be can, can people use scarves instead of masks? That was one of the questions we received. Can you just sort of wrap your wrap a scarf around your your mm -hmm. nose and mouth, and is that uh, enough? So there are the surgical uh, masks, which are used also in the medical field, um, but there are also the non-medical masks. So these are the cloth masks. Literally, you can use um, whatever cloth um, you can use, as long as it is 100% um, cotton. So like T-shirt material or pillowcase material is good. Um, and it's important that you have three layers. So we cannot use like silk scarves, which are not good. So we have to be careful of the material that we are having. It was very nice um, even to follow quickly on um, social media yesterday that we were seeing that a number of people really um, brought out their sewing machine again and started doing these cloth masks. And um, that gives the beauty of our Maltese population who improvised to the situation, who actually we have a lot of talent going out all day. So but that was really the nice to see that. They've got to be careful then about washing these masks, right? About touching the mask with their fingers. You were, you were talking a bit about that today in today's press conference about how to wear a mask correctly and to know when and where to, to use it. Is there a, I don't know, is there a helpline for, for people to get this kind of information as well? Or, or is it just, uh, you know, look it up on the internet? Yes, yes, it, you can look up on the internet. There's a lot of information. And we are also uploading on our um, social media sites um, how to actually do, do the washing up, which is very important that cloth masks are washed at 60 degrees centigrade so that any viruses are then um, killed. And very important what you said is that you don't keep on touching the mask um, because then you will contaminate your hands and also then you can contaminate the face. Some people keep on arranging the mask on their face, etc. And in reality, the visors work very well. They are good enough. And it's very important that um, we can um, allow the use of these visors. Yeah. Um, we, we heard that there are no, I think Prime Minister said it today, you were, you were too specific, you said that they, people could go to court if they're not wearing the mask, but there isn't a specific fine for not wearing the mask, correct? Um, and and I, I also want to get the... Okay, and we lost that. <laughs> um, so let's just wait till she joins the stream again. So that is Charmaine Gauchi, as we said, the, the superintendent of public health, asking a number of questions about the, the realities in, in Malta. I'll just give a bit of a roundup until uh, the connection comes back. Um, so as as we said, the numbers in Malta have have reduced uh, quite quite rapidly. Uh, we only have uh, seventy seven or seventy nine active um, cases at the moment. Uh, very few people in in hospital as well. Only only two in in Mother Day, for example. But the the what what Charmaine was explaining as well is how important it is to now start introducing other uh, medical. <clears throat> other medical um, interventions that have been stopped for a while. So this is something that, uh, you know, there was obviously a backlog uh, and, and this is why it's, it's very important to keep the numbers uh, as low as they are so that, uh, you know, now we can start to deal with other, other medical uh, situations, including vaccinations, for example, that uh, we, we had a, 
there, were, there was a slowdown in the number of parents who were taking their children for, for vaccination. People were afraid to do so. And now that's uh, very important to, to, keep, to keep up now, especially because flu season could uh, start to approach again. Um, we also spoke about masks. As we know, masks um, have now, uh, first of all, there's been the price capping on masks, but okay, wait, we've got Carmen joining the stream again. Hey. Hi, and you're Hi. back. <laughs> Someone lost. It's okay, it's okay. I was asking you about masks and, and, and whether there were any financial penalties uh, around it. But also, I have this question about uh, children with autism and, and how difficult it is for them to uh, remain with a, with a mask on. I, I want to get a sense um, more than, you know, I, I don't know, people seem to want to punish themselves and have fines and things and things like this. But I want to get a sense from you about, like, the, the kind of compassion that we should expect and, and reasonableness, you know, in this situation. You might be at a shop, there might be a child not wanting to, to, wear, the, to wear a mask. Uh, what's your advice over here? How, how, how aggressive should we be with each other? Um, uh, we really understand that this is a new situation for all of us. I mean, um, in the Mediterranean culture, we're not um, used to wearing masks or visors, so we need um, to understand um, the reaction of the public. But also what's good about it is that um, when we have young children, um, we need to sell it to them, that um, this is something which like some will need to wear glasses, so this is something um, which we need to wear as well. Um, for the good of everyone. And by um, selling this to the children that by wearing a mask or wearing a visor, you will be actually protecting other people. So this sense of altruism, if it works for everyone, I'm sure that the children will be supportive. I understand that there may be children with special needs, which may be more difficult, but with a lot of patience, I'm sure that we will be able to manage to um, deal with the situation as well. Okay, so so a few a few more questions. First of all, many people are asking us about weddings. People have postponed their weddings to let's say September or October, um, but a lot of people are fearing that even that is 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 not enough until there is a vaccine and until the population is is properly vaccinated. Can we just expect to not have the sort of weddings that we used to have? You know, five six hundred people in a, in, in the same venue. Yeah. Yes, I honestly wish I can really reply to that, but um, it's difficult to predict um, because um, we know that the way um, we are reinstituting the measures is that um, we are taking um, some time to be able um, to measure exactly the impact of these measures. So the measures that we have started back again were the measures which would have had low or intermediate risk. We cannot um, risk um, introducing the very high risk measures now because of the impact that it would have would be very um, high and we will be going back to where we were or even worse. So we are instituting back the measures slowly, slowly um, to be able to measure this. So if things go well um, uh, and we wouldn't have um, an impact on the number of cases, on the number of admissions, on the number of IT beds that um, will be required, then we will be able to move step by step. So honestly, it's more like how um, everyone cooperates. Um, this virus um, knows very well what we're doing. So literally, we have to be careful that um, we don't have a vaccine, so we don't have anything to attack this virus with, except the public health measures and the cooperation of the public um, to be sure that we continue to um, be adherent to the measures to actually attack this virus. But, but, if, but if a relative asks you, you know, should I, should I postpone my wedding to 2001 or should I uh, hope to do it in, in winter, what would your advice okay. be? We really wouldn't know whatever is going to come <laughs> um, next year. There could be another pandemic, you never know. So it's really, I know it's a situation of uncertainty. What about making, it smaller? What about making weddings smaller? Does that help at all? Um, we know that, as you can have seen with the congregation, um, our uh, measures are to slowly, slowly start increasing. So that's part of the relaxation of the measures. But obviously, um, uh, a congregation of hundreds of people is surely a high risk factor. So that is one of the measures which have been assessed as high risk. 
I'm going to try to speed it up now because I know that we're running out of time, but there's still a few questions. So first of all, sports. A lot of people are asking, you know, can I still play tennis? I mean, it's one person, another person, you're far away from each other. You know, is that okay? Is there, are there any sports that someone can do uh, within the, the, this new sort of relaxation of measures? Yeah. yeah. So basically, um, with activities, organized activities um, have been postponed because we know that can lead um, to um, people who are meeting very frequently and also people who are not usually in contact with each other. However, um, we still encourage physical activity, which is very important. So the fact that someone goes out who is not vulnerable and goes out for a walk um, in places where he's not likely to meet um, many other people, or a job or whatever, that um, can be permissible and can be done. The most important thing is that we avoid um, congregations of people and that is why we have um, uh, stopped um, organized activities. So that, that includes going to a swimming pool that's, that's shared, that, that you wouldn't uh, Yes, recommend. up to now pools are closed, yes. Um, and, and tennis clubs and things like yes. that. that, that okay um what about offices so we know a lot of people stopped going to work um not because they were asked to by the law but because you know in general the the, the rules of social distancing sort of indicate that has anything changed on that front or from your perspective you know should people refrain from going to offices with more than 10 20 people in them so we had a lot of good initiatives from various workplaces whereby um, a lot of workplaces could work through telework. Okay? We have seen the civil service as well. Um, many people um, have um, been asked to even um, go and work from the home, which is very good. Um, work has continued. I have experienced as well from other offices that we have within the health as well. So work has continued anyway. We understand that there is some work which cannot be done um, from um, telework. So that's a situation where that work has continued. But I believe that this um, COVID pandemic has taught us a lot. We have found means and ways whereby we can communicate, um, which is very good. We have means and ways how to do meetings um, between us without being actually physically present. And those that have taught us ways that um, we have seen that whatever we thought some work couldn't be done from the home, we now have actually seen that it can work. So I believe that it will be a new normal. Fair enough, but should business owners be, be sort of uh, advised that this, they should plan for this for the next, you know, six months? Or, or, or will, you, will you at some point tell them you can start going back to work because we've managed this, this rate of transmission that is good for now? Would, would, do you expect to, to say that at any stage? Um, we, ha we haven't stopped um, work um, workplaces, as you see. Um, some workplaces have actually taken measures themselves to reduce um, the number of people who are in the offices. So um, it's very important that each business and each um, workplace will do his own risk assessment to understand how um, better he can um, decrease the risk of transmission, as they have al already done but also making sure that within this phase that we know that there are still viruses going on from one person to the other, he can see how he, he can reduce um, the risk of having an outbreak at the workplace. What about schools? Um, are we, people have asked about summer schools and people are also asking about exams. We know that some exams were moved to September. Is that still uh, likely to, to go on or are we looking at alternatives in terms of doing exams online, for example? Yes, up to now, um, the plans are the same as they are because we need to keep our options as open as possible because that all depends on how we move um, with the relaxation of these measures. So we are um, looking at making sure that we have the right monitoring tools and continue monitoring to see what the impact of um, this relaxation will be for the coming three weeks and then we we'll continue assessing. But even with the Education Ministry, um, we are working in very close collaboration so that all the plans will be there and then you will be able to adapt according to the circumstances. And in general, um, because I think some people interpreted the relaxation of rules to mean that, you know, maybe they can meet a few more people outside of the household, in, uh, you know, in, in general terms. Um, your, your advice at the moment is, you know, stay home, only spend time with people in your household or, or is there, uh, you know, can, can it be a bit more broad than that at, at any rate? At this stage, um, we need to keep um, all the other measures stable. 
um, because we have changed um, the fact that we have relaxed the measures of up to four people, um, uh, the Godo ferry and also the retail outlets. So we keep the rest stable. So it's very important that um, the people stay with their own household. They don't invite other people coming up to their houses. We have to be very careful. Next Sunday is Mother's Day. I would like to pass a message about this. It's very important that um, many parents may be young, but we have uh, many mothers who are um, vulnerable because they are of old age. Um, we have to be careful um, and avoiding inviting um, people over to each other's homes. Let's be innovative, see how means we can um, talk to our mother and celebrate Mother's Day. However, we cannot risk the health of our parents. It's very important to stick to these measures. Yeah, and just a note maybe on, on deliveries. I know that, that you know, there's some, some guidelines over there. Probably a lot of people want to send their, their mothers uh, gifts and maybe flowers yes. and chocolates and whatever. Uh, is that okay? Can they can they do that? May I suggest that the gifts are sent like three days in advance. Um, they will get se be kept sealed in a safe place, and then um, our mother will open them on Sunday. So that <laughs> um, will be re um, reducing the risk. Yeah. And obviously travel, uh, we've got a lot of questions on travel. We understand that that is probably the last measure that would be uh, permitted, right? Uh, but is there any scenario in your mind where, where uh, we, we could see travel opening uh, before uh, a vaccine is found, maybe even before winter, for example, the end of summer or something like that? We have to assess the situation very carefully. We have seen countries like we've seen Portugal who are opening up their flights. So we will have a good learning lesson from there as well. So we'll see what happens. Okay. So uh, I don't know if there's anything else you want to mention. I had some other questions about the, the migration situation. I know that you're looking uh, closely into that uh, in, yes. in how far. Um, and, and also... Uh, there was we had a story about the increase in elderly deaths in, in in March. So there was a time when you know this this pandemic might have been leading to uh, you know some some additional deaths over there. But in general, I just want to get your your conclusion. You know, I, I know you said you know Malta is doing very well. Now we need to sort of keep things keep the, keep things going as as they are. Uh, to sustain it, but what is your uh, maybe maybe f what are your fears and your hopes moving into these next few weeks? Yeah. Yes, um, as you said, Malta has been doing very well. Um, it's all the fruit of the cooperation of the public, cooperation that we have seen. Um, a lot of sacrifices by everyone. Um, it's not nice um, to be especially, for example, separated from your elderly parents. Um, uh, children staying at home, not being able to meet their school friends. However, um, we have to be careful that all the sacrifices that everyone has done, this whole nation has done, um, we don't lose them during this transition phase. Let us hang on, hang on. And um, we are moving slowly, but um, step by step. Um, if we move step by step um, and we make sure that our um, situation remains stable, then we will be able um, to go into a new normal because obviously we can never be um, fully back to where we were last Christmas. Um, and also um, another important thing is that I would like um, to thank everyone, thanking everyone um, to being so cooperative um, and a lot of hard work by everyone. The people within the health sector have been um, very um, cooperative with the public. We have given all our hearts out to the public and also all the rest of the people, the police, the AFM. Everyone has been working so hard on this, but everything is dependent on how we all cooperate and adhere to the measures that we have right now. Thank you very much, Professor Charmaine. It's, you're, you're a mother yourself. Happy Mother's Day for, for when, when, when that happens next week. Um, and thanks for all your advice and your, your frequent press conferences. Sorry we didn't manage to ask all the questions. I know there were questions about dentists and, and gynecologists and other things, but I think in, in general got the gist, which is we're, we're relaxing uh, and, and testing the, the measures that we've relaxed, and then we're going to see how to kind of in, improve those as, as we go, depending on the, the, the results. So uh, thank you very much for being with us. Let's give a bit of a conclusion and, and uh, 
we'll we'll see you tomorrow anyway at, at your next press conference <laughs> thank you so yeah that was uh charmaine gauchi uh superintendent of public health uh, we had a very long conversation about all the all the sort of questions that people are having in, in general very proud of, of her work and the results of the Maltese uh, of the Maltese public, um, but the, the message remains clear: you should hang out with people in your household, should do exercise, but not in clubs and not in uh, in other uh, activities where, where you could be uh, mixing with other other people, um, and and wear your masks, wear them safely, and get some guidance on how to do so and how to reuse them or, or, or wash them or you know dispose of them. Um, schools, weddings, travel, these are things which are still highly uncertain. Uh, unfortunately, there, isn't, there aren't many clear answers on of that because we uh, don't know how uh, the virus is going to respond to the, the, the measures that we're, that we're relaxing bit by bit. Um, so, in general, be innovative, find ways to continue working from home, find ways to continue exercising from home. Uh, find ways of keeping in touch, even on Mother's Day. If you're going to be send, sending uh, any gifts on Mother's Day, try to make sure they arrive three days before so that the, they could be put in a quarantine period. From my end, uh, thanks for watching another episode of COVID Calls. Don't forget to check out our Charmaine merch, <laughs> another, another uh, quarantine-related merchandise that we've launched. Uh, again, to help us make a bit of a better situation. Uh, bit of fun in a, in a bit of a bad situation uh, and also a memory of the times that we're that we're living in so uh, souvenirs that don't suck dot uh, get your hands on some of these products every purchase gives one euro to richmond foundation uh, to help give the gift of therapy so again mental health a very important part of of this battle this covid battle try to take care of yourself stay safe uh, show love and and uh, you know keep in touch with your with your loved ones as much as possible because obviously there's a lot of people feeling lonely and being um in in a very difficult situation especially the elderly uh, who are who are unable to uh, see their relatives even at, at these times so uh, that's it from me uh, i've been chris Perigin. this has been COVID calls and thanks for watching join us again tomorrow where we'll be talking about the education sector so that's 4 p.m tomorrow COVID calls thank you very much <laughs>